Somehow we have blitzed to the halfway point of the regular season for Ohio State. The Buckeyes are 6-0. and They beat Purdue 41-7 to on Saturday at ross Aid Stadium. And when they do that, the next day we've got to have Zach Bourne in for his Sunday, Sunday Blitz. So welcome back to the podcast. He is Zach Bourne, and I am Austin Ward. Zach, grade it. What do you think about Saturday's performance as you get to the midway point? And I know Penn State is next Saturday, but let's talk mainly about Purdue yep. as long as we can. I thought it was a great performance from the standpoint of, you know, going through some trials and tribulations against Maryland after the bye week, then knowing that you have Penn State, you know, coming up, you go into Ross Aid Stadium, place where Ohio State has not played well at all, as, as we talked about last week, and you put up a performance that, in my opinion, might be the most complete performance that we've seen uh, this Ohio State football team have this year. You know, there there were obviously the stats um, weren't all that great. Uh, I shouldn't say weren't all that great. Weren't what they could have been on the passing side just because of the weather, uh, some drop passes, things of that sort. But they ran the ball, uh, which we've been looking for for a long time. Uh, the defense played played pretty soundly. I think there were some things that the coaches are going to want to clean up, especially maybe in the run game when uh, we're on the run defensive game, right? That that Penn State's going to obviously challenge Ohio State with. But all around, I think it was a complete game and the most complete game we've seen this year. Yeah, it, it's hard to – and Burn brought this up when we were you know leaving on Saturdays. Like, you could find some things and say it was a mixed bag, like some pros and cons. Like, that's going to be the case in every game. So the way that I took it, when you know, leaving West Lafayette and heading back to Columbus, like I don't think you're going to ask for a lot more than a 34, 34 point win on the road. Offense does good things. Defense does does some good things. Special teams had uh, some positives with Jermaine Matthews flying around on kickoff coverage, like really impressive stuff from him. If all three phases have positives and you're the win is never in doubt, you got a fast start, you controlled the game throughout. Yeah, they could have won by more. But also, do they get bonus points for that? I don't think they do. Yeah, here's my question is that, you know, I, I was obviously with it being a away game was on Twitter during, um, you know, during the game. My question is, how, how, how do Ohio State fans think negatively of that performance? Like, how do you watch that game? And want to go out on Twitter and publicly say that you're not impressed with the team, that you think it's an awful, awful performance. Like, I don't get what people are saying. You you look at that first half. That first half was about as clean as you can get. Besides Devin Brown fumbling a you know a, a, a touchdown run, which should have been a touchdown, so that gets you to to 28 technically, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have a. a uh, one other series where the offense got off offline because Simmons had an awful holding penalty. But if you take that penalty away, they, they completed a pass for like 20 yards. They would have been in Purdue territory if it weren't for that holding call that put them behind the stick. So it's like you look at that first half, it very easily could have been 35 nothing if not for a dumb penalty and a fumble. Like right. I don't understand how people can can look at that and say this is unacceptable. You know, do, do you want to go back to 2018 when you get beat 42 to 20? Now that's unacceptable. You know, so that's why I just I don't understand fans all the time. I don't think they realize how tough it is to uh, go on the road or in general play a Division One football team and beat them by 50 points. Like they're not playing Capital, they're not playing Otterbein, right? Like you are playing a team with division one football players. It's not like they, they, they suck where they're so bad that they can't do anything. I guarantee you all of the, all, all of the keyboard pirates behind their phones, they would get their ass beat by the, by, by Purdue. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like, I, I don't know what they're, I don't know what they're trying to get at from my standpoint. That first half was about as good as it can be. The rain starts coming down harder, close to halftime. You were there, yeah. right? But you could see it on TV. You go out in the second half, you take it down, you score right away. Next thing you know, it's 27 nothing. Rain's coming down even more. Of course, there's going to be some uninspired football in the second half. Like, come on, Purdue couldn't do anything. So it's like, how do you continue to continually stay motivated as a team? It's it's hard. It's really hard. And Ryan even said after the game, hey, there's probably a little uninspired football in the second half, right? Kind of hard to get up in the pouring rain when you're just beating a team like that. You know, so it's like, 
And if you look at it, second half, half the stadium filtered out, right? Like people didn't even stay around for the second half to stay in the rain. So <laughs> I don't understand what people are so upset about. If from my standpoint, that's probably the best performance you could have had going into this week. Yeah, there was more urgency for Ohio State to get everybody showered and on the bus and on the plane back home than there was to put up more points in the second half. There, that was a tight running ship that they had. Like, let's beat the weather and get out of here. And also, by the way, start recovering and planning for Penn State. But we will still get to that. You mentioned the Devin Brown fumble going in. Uh, Ohio State used that new red zone package a couple times. First time, big success. Two runs from Devin Brown and a handoff. The third uh, play goes for a touchdown for him. Second time, uh, not so much. They went back to it again and only briefly then put Kyle McCord back in to throw the touchdown uh, to Cade Stover. So, I don't. what do you make of it, Zach? Uh, I, I have to say I'm not the biggest fan of any quarterback rotations. I think I've been pretty upfront about that throughout the years. I don't know if this is a different variation of that for you that you like it. But how did you feel seeing it on Saturday? I was surprised by it when I saw it. You know, you, you obviously going into the season, as you and I know, that's kind of where they thought Devin would fit in anyways, being more of a, a running quarterback, change of pace from that standpoint. We saw that in the Indiana game when, you know, they say there was a quarterback competition and you saw most of Devin's plays being your know, running read option type plays. I don't hate it, um, especially when the quarterback runs the football, it's hard to defend it. Right. You 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 have to literally defend everyone then and in a normal offense when a quarterback's just handed it off, no one's got to defend the quarterback, right? Once the quarterback hands it off, he's he's dead from that right. standpoint. So um I like the change up. I like that they showed it this week, knowing that now Penn State's gonna have to game plan for it, whether Ohio State's running it or not. So it might be one of those things where Ohio State was just going to throw the package out there. So now Penn State's got to spend, you know, their film guys have to spend a couple hours breaking it down. What can they do off of it? They have to watch the film. The defense is going to have certain calls when Devin Brown runs on the field. And I've been there on the defense side where you practice things during the week and you come to the game, you're like, my God, we never even saw that, never even had those calls. We spent all this time on these checks and didn't even have to use them. So, <laughs> um, I, you know, who knows? Uh how much this this package is going to grow um i think they can do some good things with it especially we i think everyone knows they've had some issues with short yardage and when you get a quarterback run uh it, it just adds a new dynamic to to the offense so i don't hate it um i will uh start disliking it if they use it too much and try and have devin throw a lot out of it because i think if you're going to throw the football put the ball in Kyle McCord's hands, right? right? They can do some gimmicks off of it. You know, they can do some motion. They can run a couple different things from that standpoint, um, but don't overutilize it. I think that's the part that has me, I don't know, intrigued, uh, on alert with it. When they put Devin Brown in and let him throw, I was like, well, that, and it was a near interception. It's like, that seems odd. If you're going to get down there and you have up this special package, um, the throwing part doesn't seem to make a ton of sense because Kyle McCord has already proven that he is this team's starting quarterback and passer. And the other part of that that I think no one ever points to Kyle McCord and says, this guy is a dynamic athlete. I, I understand that. I'm not making the case that he is. But he pulled in on his own read, designed mm -hmm. and called in that, in that game yesterday. We've seen opportunities in the past, scrambling and diving forward. Like, he has, in my opinion, enough athleticism to run in those situations if they call it. And I, I think that sometimes there's this tendency with Ohio State to overthink things. Like, they're, hey, kudos for creativity, willingness to experiment. They're trying to find solutions. Like I, I kind of think that they could have got some of that without taking their starting quarterback off the field, who, by the way, was still making the seventh start of his career and sixth of this season with an offensive line working through things that they're trying to get ready for Penn State. Like, I don't know that I, that's the other part. I'm like I don't, taking away the reps from the starter. I'm just not a, pro, a big vocal proponent of that. Yeah. So, so two things from that standpoint, um, I think the throws that we saw from Devin goes back to kind of what I was saying of you're showing things on tape and you're not going to see them very often, but you wanted to show them this week to make sure Penn state uh, got ready for him. And I think that's probably why they had Devin throw the ball. Um, yeah. Cause now it's like, Hey, Penn state now, 
it's not like they're only just running out of uh, out of this formation, right? When 33 comes in the game, they can't throw it, so we have to be able to watch for that. Um, sure. So that may have been a gimmicky thing. Um, when it comes to Kyle McCord as well, yes, he can run it. I loved how he kept the ball yesterday. The entire defense went one way. You know, he had a uh, eight or nine yard gain, right? When when he kept it on the read option. Um, I think one thing that probably Ryan Day is thinking with the short yardage quarterback runs is, you know, you saw him yesterday. They were almost quarterback leads. That's what they looked like. Chip train them. It was a fake handoff, but it was a, you know, halfway decent fake handoff, if that. And Chip train was leading the way. I think a little bit. Uh, I'm not saying Kyle McCord can't do that. I think maybe Ryan um, worries that Kyle McCord isn't built like JT Barrett. Kyle McCord isn't even built like uh, Justin Fields, right? Like he's not a guy that they probably want to take hits, um, especially inside the box in short yarded situations. So, um, not saying Devin Brown's a pawn by any means, but I think in that situation, you're like, hey, let's put 33 in the game. Let's let let's get him downhill. You know, if he does take a big hit inside the box, it's okay. It's not Kyle. Um, and, yep. and so yeah, so you're taking some hits off of six. That makes sense. I can get behind that part, Zach. That's that's why I listen to you. Um, what else do you have for me to learn about this game? I think the rushing attack, the offensive line, we saw a lot of new stuff there um, or some new success perhaps maybe is a better way of putting it and Dallin Hayden was the catalyst for that Ohio State had talked all last week Zach well he's going to play four games the intention is to redshirt Dallin Hayden and then lo and behold that night they, they scratch Travion Henderson who went through warm-ups again they decided to be conservative with that upper body situation Mayan Williams was ruled out beforehand and then Chip Trainum uh uh, unfortunately and clearly suffers a concussion taking a big hit it, that was that was pretty scary to watch when he uh, tried to get to the sideline and just f flat out fell down so Ohio State got in that same situation they were in last year running back room is depleted injuries Dallin Hayden goes out he looked pretty effective to me well, look at what Dallin did last year against Maryland he got one chance last year right and went out and ran for what 160 yards against Maryland and kind of saved the game in a half and then, right I mean yeah and yeah kind of in half and then you saw what he was able to do yesterday you know rushing for 78 yards or 76 yards whatever it was averaging almost seven yards per carry um I'd say but we haven't seen that this year you know, in every game that's happened, we haven't seen that running back average uh, runs like that continuously. You know, you saw yep. Trey hit the big home run against Notre Dame, uh, but there hasn't been that consistency in the running game. And it's something that I think Ryan and his coaching staff has to look at, has to look at. Um, he, you know, I tweeted it out yesterday. I hardly ever tweet during games, but just watching that, um, and I don't know how it looked in person. You could probably give more feedback from that standpoint. But just looking at it and watching replays on TV, there's just something about him. It, it, it's that it factor, right? And you know, he's not the biggest dude. I don't think he's the fastest dude. Probably isn't even the quickest guy in the running back room. But if you see what he does once he gets in the balls in the ball in his hand with the vision, the acceleration, uh, the the way that he gets downhill. He puts his foot in the ground, sees it, and goes. Um, and there were so many four- and five-yard runs yesterday that we're not used to seeing, right? So many times this year, we've seen, you know, how many times? One- or two-yard gains. You hardly ever saw that with Dallin yesterday, and I think you have to as Ryan Day and this offense starts to take put you know steps in front of one another and move on to the next week, and Ryan has said it, we got to grow every single week, you have to look at what Dallin brings to this offense. And if that means putting five back there and then having a change of pace guy with um, uh, Travion, so be it. You know, I, I also think, hey, I love what Chip has done. I've been outspoken about what I think Chip can bring to the offense, but – there's also other things that Chip can do. You know, I you look at, you know, Ryan was in San Francisco. when He, he coached for the 49ers, right? Mm -hmm. Look at what Kyle Juszczyk does for the Niners right now. They use him as a fullback, but he's an H. He does so many different things. And nothing against, you know, G. Scott and, and what's out there, but he's not a big-time uh, uh, big blocker, right? He's a wide receiver that went to tight end. I think if you can put Chip in a situation where instead of 
12 personnel, you're running 21 personnel, and you're able to motion chip. You're able to put them as a YY. You're able to do different things with chip where he can go and block a defensive end. We saw him run power yesterday on court on quarterback lead, right? He he can block a defensive end. He has to do it in pass pro. Right. Let the dude get downhill and be that extra blocker from that standpoint, utilize him in different ways rather than the tailback position and make it, you know, the five and 32 show. Yeah. To me, to me, it just feels like, as you said, something's different, Zach. I think that Dallin Hayden has pretty good vision and understanding of the assignments and like what it takes to play running back. I mean, that's, that's part of his bloodline and his genetics there. And then decisiveness, like, I, I think that sometimes that's where Ohio State gets bogged down. Uh, we've talked about that in the past, going back to the JK and Mike Weber era and before that, like the the desire to hit a home run and and how much that might cost you, uh, you know, on a consistent basis if that's what you're trying to do. You you may have the big hits, but stringing together singles and doubles, I think, is good enough for this Ohio State offense. Like I, I I'm of the mindset where averaging four and five maybe throwing in some six and seven yeah. is good enough because all Ohio State really needs is a defense to take their running game seriously because their most success is still going to come through the air. Uh, and that didn't quite resonate the way that I would have thought yesterday. The, the numbers still, it, they could have looked a lot better for Kyle McCord and they, they still weren't bad, but five drops in that weather, uh, it could have looked even better than it was. I think that's like, I'm not, I'm not dwelling on that, not pointing the fingers. I understand those things happen, but you know, I thought that the, that version of the Ohio State offense is probably going to be one that could cause problems for Penn State on Saturday, but we'll see. Yeah, I think every team so far this year has put a whole bunch of guys in the box. They're like, hey, Kyle Kyle needs to beat us. You saw that early on, earlier on in the year. You saw Notre Dame do that. Um, and I think finally got to Maryland, and Maryland's like, okay, guess what? We're, we're doing it. We are going all out and committing to the box, and if you guys are beating us, you got to throw it. And I think we saw that against Maryland, right? Where the first half they're like, everyone's talking about the run game. We got to come out, run the football, run the football. So Ryan Day is like, hey, we're going to come out and try and run the football. Well, you saw in the second half, finally they're like, screw it. They're putting so many guys in the box, we're going to throw it. You saw the same thing with Purdue. They were putting a bunch of guys in the box, and we are still being successful because of what Dallin Hayden was bringing to the team. And we were still able to throw the football. Here's the thing. This Penn State team, this defense that's ranked number one in the country, they're not going to throw extra guys in the box because they know, hey, Ohio State has won these games throughout the season because of what Marvin Harrison has been able to do, because of what that wide receiver room can do. We're not going to let those guys beat us. We believe our front six or seven – can match up with Ohio State and we can win those one-on-one -on -one matchups. So now you need a running back in there who can find those holes because you're not going to have a loaded box where you can check to a pass play, right? If it's run, guess what? Penn State's going to say run it, right? We're, we're keeping dudes in position. We're not cheating guys down. Try and run the football against us. And so you need someone to set the tone from that standpoint. You need someone to have great vision. You need someone to get downhill. Like the things that Dallin Hayden brings to this offense is what you're going to need against Penn State and Michigan. They're not going to load the box and say quarterback beat us. They right. are going to play their normal stuff and say we are just as good as you. Let's go. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point as well. The only real negative I think that you take out of a trip to West Lafayette, Denzel Burke had to be helped back to the locker room uh, by a trainer. Not sure of the severity of that situation yet. Really not even sure what happened, Zach. There were a few replays. He looked like he kind of got rolled up on on that tackle. Purdue hit a, a throw down the seam. Uh, maybe Jordan Hancock hit him uh, low. I'm not sure what, what happened. I didn't see him after the game or get an update on that. Uh, so that'll be something that has to be watched in the next day or two. He's one of... As I as I picked a couple of weeks ago, I thought he was one of the most important players, if not the most important player on Ohio State's defense in the first half. I could be wrong about that, but I know he's in the top two or three, uh, so that's important. Ameka Buka didn't travel. Uh, you had Chip Trainum get knocked out with the concussion. Travion Henderson didn't play. Mayan Williams didn't play. You know, those are kind of isolated group there. Ohio State doesn't have a ton of injuries, but they are all at skill positions. Yeah, uh, the, the the Denzel Burke one's interesting, right? I think w no one really knows uh, the severity of it like you talked about. One positive, though, and I think Denzel Burke's amazing. We've talked about him on this show this year about the, the transformation that he's made going into the season, the product that he's put out. The one thing about um, Denzel Burke, though, that 
you know, I don't get nervous about is you still have Jordan Hancock and OGB as corners who can both play like hell, right? Yep. Um, Penn State, they're going to want to run the football. So you're going to see a lot of 12 personnel. You, you will see some 11, you know, and maybe Jermaine Matthews comes in then, but you still have Sonny Styles who can match up against slot receivers. You yep. still have Sonny Styles who can play that nickel position, and I think this week, more than others, they're going to want Sonny on the field, which makes only two corners available on, on the field anyways because Sonny can support the run. And Penn State is going to be committed to running the football. I, I know everyone thinks Drew Aller is the next coming of uh, you know, the Caleb Williams, but at the end of the day, he's not. You look at his stats. He's a good quarterback, has a powerful arm, but Penn State isn't trying to light you up through the air. They want to establish the run and then let Drew pass off of that. So if you have Sonny Styles who's able to support in the box and come down on the run game and do those things and shut down the run, Penn State's going to be in for a long day uh, from an offensive standpoint. So I don't think as a defense you need to worry so much about that because you do have depth on the back end finally uh, and some yeah. really good depth. Um, plus another thing that I want people to realize, and it, it, it would be a shame for you and I not to mention it, can we talk about Cody Simon and what <laughs> he did yesterday? Absolutely I mean, you can. Uh, leading tackler, right? Leading tackler for yesterday's game. Didn't even play all the defensive snaps. Came downhill, stuffing holes. What played really well. He is getting better and better. And you know, I've always been a huge fan of Steel Chambers. You know that. Mm -hmm. um, and I still am a huge fan of Steel Chambers. But what Cody Simon was able to bring to the defense yesterday, I think you're going to see more of that. And I think Jim Knowles and this defense coaching staff are staff are going to have to explore getting him on the field more. Yeah, I was thinking on the drive home on Saturday night. I wonder if Zach wants to pop a little Cody Simon film on Buck IQ this week, and I. I think I just had my suspicions confirmed, and we'll do that later on this week and look at that because that is the one area of the defense where Jim Knowles, Ohio State, have looked like more willing to evaluate playing time and options to get things quote-unquote fixed. They are, they've are they been a top-five defense all year long. You know that Larry Johnson has a rotation plan. We've seen some of that to varying degrees, uh, none at all against Notre Dame and like uh, at defensive end, I think they've they've managed that probably better, in my opinion, than in years past. And you know, it's, they've got a pretty good group that they're consistent with at safety and corner, so they haven't had to do that there. Line, this linebacker spot, especially because of Steel Chambers' track record, it does resonate when they're putting Cody Simon in there for the volume of snaps that that he was getting, and that there had to have been some element of concern for Jim Knowles and James Laurinaitis over the last couple of weeks about hey. How serious is the problem? Is this a, a slump that can be fixed or not fixed? Uh, and they gave Cody Simon a chance, and he made the most of it. So we will definitely come back and, and get a lot more of your thoughts on that later in the week. But for now, let's get out of here on a Sunday Blitz with three and out. Three best, uh, three best stars on Saturday. I love it. Number three is a guy that uh, I haven't given a, 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 a star to so far this year, but he has more than deserved it. Um, and so I'm going to give it to him as Kate Stover. Number three is Kate Stover. What he is able to do for this offense, um, the way he's grown in the passing game, um, two touchdowns yesterday. He's just kind of that safe blanket for Kyle McCourt, and he is growing more and more into this offense. You can see that they're literally designing plays for him now, um, and when his number is called, he he answers. Number two, I'm just going to say the entire defense. I love the way they they – Flew around to the football um, late in that second quarter when Purdue, you know, got the ball down to the one yard line. So many times we've seen past years, they tuck their tails and and don't keep on fighting. They fought yesterday. Um, you know, ended up having a penalty sack. Next thing you know, missed field goal. Don't give up any points on on that possession. That's what you want to see. Um, you know, they can still clean up the the run game defense. I think that's probably the biggest glaring hole right now um, is just giving up probably more than they want to from that standpoint and some teams mm -hmm. breaking some bigger runs. But uh, what Cody Simon did yesterday, I think that's where you're going to see him a lot more is against those offenses that want to run the football because he does play the run so well. Uh, and then number one has got to be Dallin Hayden. Right, we we've talked on it, and you know nothing against Marv, who had another uh, a, 
a hundred yard day. Kyle had a good day. The offensive line, right? I'm dying to give the offensive line uh, some love on on one of these Sunday breakdowns. Yeah, uh, and hopefully we do after Penn State, right? Hopefully that that happens. <laughs> but number one's got to be Dallin Hayden for not, uh, and this is the reason why I say that because for not playing at all this year, right? Really not getting any meaningful snaps. Then hearing this week that, hey, I'm getting right-shirted, you know, and and coach being outspoken and going to the media to then turn it around and saying, oh my God, that same week, I'm going to be the leading carrier and exactly. have to help out the run game, right? So the mental aspect, as well as what he was able to do physically on the field and performance that he put out, by all means, he's going to be the number one guy. And they have to make a decision this week on Dallin is he has to be involved in the offense. I know they've got three veteran guys, but those get you know, Mayan, who even knows if he's in shape to play. That's been a big thing. And, you know, I'm sure Mayan would admit to it as well that without preseason training camp, he he wasn't able to get the reps and he's not there uh physically. You know, Chip, great player, but he, he you know, he's he's a I support it. He's a fullback, right? And all <laughs> all in all, like I, I love it, right? Yeah. I love it. But um you know, he he is more that physical style of runner that they can find some other things to do. I think Dallin's got to be your number one guy, and then Trey is your changeup guy. Trey is great in the in, in the passing game, uh, the change of pe- pace. He's your home run hitter. Dallin's got to be involved, though. So uh, long winded, we're repeating ourselves, but Dallin by far is my number one star for this past week. Good chance there'll be a lot more Dallin Hayden conversation this week as we get ready. Okay, Purdue is done. 41-7, the win is in the bank. Ohio State 6-0. Oh, hey, they're bowl eligible. Uh, yes. Not, a, not, not the achievement that Ohio State is looking for, but hey, uh, you take one at a time, and then you can enter the Roosters Bowl trip giveaway. You know you're going somewhere. Anyway, this is the big one. So we've got uh, all the coverage that you'd come to expect of the week of. So Zach will be part of a weekend kickoff as well. He's got Buck IQ. We've got all everything. We're getting ready. It is a massive, massive showdown on Saturday at noon in the Horseshoe against Penn State. I think both game day and big noon kickoff are going to be there. Zach's tailgate will be set up at like 4 a.m. probably. That's right. We the sure fire, will be. The fireball shots will be out. Uh, everybody's got to get ready for this one. So we will have that coverage all week. But we appreciate you wrapping up Purdue and starting that right here with us on the Sunday Blitz. Hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. I appreciate Zach Bourne as always. Thanks, man. For Zach, I am Austin Ward. We'll talk to you later.